if he's in. And he is translator. The first yeah. Oh, uh, so we'll you need next one? The text over language. Oh, okay. Okay, how? Okay. Speak slowly. Speak slowly. So, okay. so English and Chinese word in, is somewhere. Okay. So I was just told about this a few minutes ago, so I'm going to try to just say a few thoughts. I think there's not a lot of time, um, but uh, just very quickly to give you my background, I've been working in Myanmar since 2014, based in Yangon, where I've been working especially on elections issues. So I've uh, been engaged in the last two democratic elections in Myanmar, so helping political parties, civil society groups, election officials try to uh, support democratic elections. And I can say with pretty high levels of confidence that while these elections were not perfect, they were two quite good elections for a country at the stage of its democratic transition that Myanmar is at. So any suggestions that are being made is that these elections were fraudulent, which is one line that you're seeing in some public media now is not based on any credible evidence. So that's a bit of the background to what we've seen. So just um, last month, there was a coup. Uh, after about 12 years of openness, the military, which has been involved in Myanmar's politics for many, many years now, um, instituted a coup. And this coup has led to, I'm sure you've all seen about it, so I'm not going to give you all the stories, all the details, but I just want to share a few stories and, and thoughts about some things I think are important to, to understand about it. And one is the level of protest and activism against the coup that we've seen from all sectors of Myanmar society. We see young people especially, the Gen Zers, uh, leading the lines of the protest. And we see tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people out in the streets, uh, even under very considerable pressure. And one of the reasons, and I think uh, uh, we were just having this discussion a little bit ago, but the question is why are people so, why do we see such a huge uh, strength of protest and anti-coup? How, why is the level of anti-coup protest so high? And part of it is just because for this young generation, they feel like their future is being taken away. So we have people who've had relative freedom since 2012. They've had a lot more opportunities in education. They've had a lot more opportunities in employment. They've had a lot more opportunities just to live their lives in relatively normal ways, like we're seeing young people live their lives. Um, and so you see now a lot of the protests that are being led are being led by 20-somethings uh, and even by teenagers. Uh, many of them just marching on the streets, uh, organized uh, with whatever security they can have. Uh, but we're seeing a huge uh, anti-coup movement. And it's not just young people. There are many different groups from all sectors of society across the country engaging in all sorts of creative and um, in unusual ways of protest, unusual forms of protest, there's a huge amount of opposition. We can see that if we look at the, the reason why this is so is just partly that this military government is so incredibly unpopular. Uh, there's some sort of very preliminary surveys that have been done on the coup, and it shows that almost nobody supported the coup. And so given this, that this opposition has been so high, that it's been so almost, almost universal throughout the country, uh, one of the things we've now seen is that there's been a huge crackdown and a very violent um, and dangerous crackdown, which I'm sure you've all seen in the news. Uh, and one of the things I also want to communicate here is just to think a little bit about, and I think is important to remember, and it's hard to, it's hard to even imagine when you're sitting here, but just the sheer level of violence that the military has used on its population and the impacts that has had. Uh, we have official figures of over 200 dead, but that doesn't do anything to tell the story about how this is felt uh, to people in their everyday lives. Uh, it doesn't do anything to tell you the feelings of insecurity that people have, so you can go around to uh, Myanmar neighborhoods in Yangon in the capital and uh, for the past month plus, people basically can't sleep securely in their homes because they could be um, 
um, dragged out of their homes any night. Uh, there are random shots being fired in the street, which are entering into people's windows. Uh, there are people being dragged out uh, for sheltering other protesters. There are people who are being um, killed or uh, imprisoned just for being in the vicinity of things that are happening. So uh, it's an incredibly insecure and precarious time. Um, and we see this impacting some of us also in very, very personal ways. So we have uh, within my office, uh, our driver, his, his son was a t-shirt here, sorry. His son was a protester, a 17-year-old, just started medical school and was on Sunday shot and killed uh, by security forces. So you can, it's in quite, been quite widely covered by the news. Uh, he was a 17 year old medical student. So I apologize, just give me a second. So what we're seeing now is the question of what's going to happen next and just sort of what kinds of threats are people under and what they're facing. Um, and I think just in terms of some of the things that we've been talking about here, even their basic rights to communication are under threat. Internet is shut down every night from 1 to 9 completely. Mobile internet is now, starting this week, been completely shut down. So even access to the people who are documenting the abuses and who are trying to uh, tell people what's going on, both the journalists, the human rights documenters, it's very difficult for them now to do their work. Uh, we're seeing a huge amount of stress on people's, on people's financial livelihoods because the banking system is entirely shut down. Uh, it's almost impossible to get money into the country. We're seeing people being placed under a huge amount of threat and under constant pressure for uh, just for basic survival and basic security uh, in their homes. Uh, so what, what's, what happens next? There has been a lot of, there have been many statements by the international community. There has been a lot of attempts to apply diplomatic pressure. It's very difficult uh, to apply diplomatic pressure that works in the case of Myanmar for a number of reasons. Uh, but I think one of the important things is just for, in terms of what international communities can do, is just to continue to make sure these stories, these personal accounts of people living in this situation are able to come out to the public. Um, it's very important just to see that, to be able to continue to share those and put pressure on policymakers and advocates. And also, I think it's very important to continue, for those of you who do have contacts, and I know a number of you have done work with Myanmar before, just to think about what ways there are that you might be able to support your colleagues there working on everything from freedom of information issues to uh, being able to access secure communication and a number of other areas. So thank you very much. Thank you.